You start to become less diverse in your microbiome as we age. You start out almost like a blank slate, you get a lot more diverse, and then as we age, you start to lose that diversity and, and therefore some key functions in the microbiome. How do we define the microbiome? The microbiome is essentially all of the microbes, so the bacteria, the viruses, fungi, yeast that reside in and on us, and they are on our skin, they're in our nasal passages, they're in our lungs, uh, and, and they're in our guts. Got it. Now, our guts which run mouth to anus are outside of our body, right? So people don't think of it always that way, but of course they are. So what allows the colonization of that? I mean, is that something that is set at birth? I mean, for, so maybe taking a step back, when, when, a, when a child is in his mother's or her mother's womb, there's amniotic fluid that's flowing through that spot. Is that a sterile area? Well, interestingly, for a long time, uh, as you know, we've all believed that was an entirely sterile environment and there were no microbes there at all. Um, and some recent studies have started to kind of elucidate that there are some strains. And so the, the but it's but it's very minimal. When we think about the gut microbiome of an adult versus, you know, somebody who's in the womb, I mean, it's, it's incredibly much more diverse once you become an adult. And, and in fact, Really, the primary initial seeding of the microbiome is um, through the delivery, you know, uh, uh, in the vaginal canal. And so, um, and this is we're going to get gross for a second, but literally, as as you're being delivered, you are consuming fecal matter that is in the vaginal canal, and that's your first seeding of microbes. And infants have, you know, a, a very small diversity of microbes that uh, are really kind of tied to mother's breast milk. And then, as you start to eat foods, and as you start to get exposed exposure to other environments, then the diversity of your microbiome starts to really grow and flourish. And then at some point on the aging process, the opposite starts happening. You start to become less diverse in your microbiome as we age. So you start out almost like a blank slate, you get a lot more diverse, and then as we age, you start to lose that diversity and, and therefore some key functions in the microbiome. When is peak diversity approximately? What decade of life? Well, uh, obviously it varies from person to person, but if you can remember a time where you could eat or drink whatever you wanted to and you didn't have to worry about it, that would probably be the time. <laughs> oh, so that's actually quite young. I mean, certainly for Teenagers. me, that would have been as a teenager, yeah. exactly. Yeah. When I could indeed eat a bowl of cereal for every meal with no consequence. Yep. <laughs> um, okay. So, and by a, by bowl, I mean a bowl the size of my head. So it's a box per bowl per meal. Um, okay. So we have a relatively early peak in life for diversity. You hear all of these sort of bumper sl stickers, slogans about the gut biome. Oh, it outnumbers us ten to one. Is that true? I think those numbers uh, have have definitely come into question. I mean, they're they're nice to kind of give people a framework for the fact that you have a ton of microbes in you, and I think that's the important part. Is that they are, whether they outnumber you 10 to 1 or 2 to 1, I think is relatively probably not that important. But what is important is that they make up a huge portion of your body, uh, mass as well as functions. And so it's an important key part of Call it even one to one. So let's just yeah, say there one are- one there is huge. There, so, so the idea is there are many cells from that are not you between your mouth and your anus as there are you. Exactly. Cells. Now, obviously- just to get have someone wrap their head around that, we're made up 70% of water. So most of our mass is water, not the cells minus the water. Are these largely anhydrous cells? Like how do they weigh so little relative to the rest of us? Oh man, I don't know the water content of bacteria, but maybe I think about it a little bit differently, which is more about the um, and again, I'm a biochemist, so everything's going to come back to that. But it's more about the biochemical functions. What's the output of each of these cells, you know, versus the output of our cells? And I think when you look at it that way, these are real workhorses. So mm -hmm. those, you know, there's there's a definitely redundancy among bacterial cells, but each of them is having multiple functions and multiple outputs. And so when you think about it at a cellular level, I would think more about what are the things being produced by the cell. And bacteria tend to secrete a lot of things that they're producing, unlike the cells in our body. Um, and so there's a, a lot of function that's associated with the microbiome that's super important. Can you um, explain to people listening uh, what the difference is between our cells and bacterial cells? Because there are some fundamental differences between these things called prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, first of all, every cell in our body uh, kind of needs the other cells and the organs and the whole system in order to be able to survive and, and do their job. Whereas bacteria, they don't need anybody else. And so every bacterial cell, every unit is its own living thing that can replicate, perform functions, lose functions, uh, be genetically modified and all of that. And so it's a, it's an, maybe this is, <laughs> this it's sort of its own entity, yep. um, its own living organism. Every cell is 
a living organism. Um, and then, you know, they divide really, really rapidly. Some of them as, you know, quickly as 10 to 15 minutes, you, you're dividing. And so there's this other component, which is that some of these uh, bacterial strains, because they divide so quickly and because they're also under the pressures of evolutionary, you know, processes is that they can evolve super quickly. And so we as humans, we have a long evolutionary timeline because, you know, it comes in the form of you make a kid who makes a kid who makes a kid. Now imagine if that was happening every 10 minutes, you can evolve really, really rapidly. And so that's part of kind of the antibiotic crisis out there, which is to say that, you know, these things can become resistant to antibiotics because of this division time. You alluded to this already, but they're they're also highly, you know, they, they have the capacity to secrete things significantly. We think of bacteria and we hear it as a bad term, right? Like we think of a bacteria is a bad thing and there clearly are some bad bacteria. But would I be oversimplifying if I said that most bacteria enjoy kind of complementary relationship with us as their host? Is that, is that fair in terms of flora, such as the bacteria on our skin, in our nasal passages, in our gut? Well, I mean, we've co-evolved with these microbes and these bacteria. And so generally speaking, when you're co-evolving with something, there's some mutual benefit. Um, and even I sort of cringe when people talk about good bacteria and bad bacteria, although I do it as well, because it's the ecosystem and the context mm. of these bacteria that's actually more relevant. Um you know, a good bacteria can become a bad bacteria in a certain situation. And, you know, likewise, a, you know, bad bacteria can become beneficial in a different context. And so I think that it's important to know they're, they're all kind of part of these different pathways and what they're doing together. So, you know, for example, Clostridium difficile is something that I think people think is a terrible pathogen and it's so bad for you. And oh my gosh, you better never get it. Almost all of us have Clostridium difficile in our guts, but at the level that it's at and in the context of the ecosystem of our strains, um, it's not having that kind of really nasty pathogenic impact. And so it really, there aren't really, in my opinion, there aren't really bad bugs. It's interesting. You know, people hear me rail about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol being meaningless terms. And of course, cholesterol is simply cholesterol. It's where it ends up that can be good or bad. So that's a, that's actually a great analogy. Um, while we're on the topic of Clostridium difficile, which we'll come back to in more detail, what is the prevalence of that as a function of total gut biome in a, in a person who's healthy and not otherwise in a pathologic state? Well, this is sort of the um, convoluting part about the microbiome, which is that if you sequence and do really deep sequencing and even biochemical assays across a person's microbiome, and then you say, all right, now I want to do population studies, what you find is that the difference between people is huge. Mm. And so the... the um, Human Microbiome Project, in which they kind of looked across 10,000 plus people at all ages and different demographics, really demonstrated that at the strain level, people are pretty different from person to person. When you start to look at the functions, that's where you start to see some redundancy. So it's hard to say for a particular strain, you know, if someone gives you an actual number and they don't give you a range, um, that's probably not correct. Wow. Interesting. Um, tell me more about that project. So you know, what were the observations it, it, it landed at vis-a-vis -vis, um, how various factors, both modifiable and unmodifiable, either genetic or age, uh, and diet being the most obvious modifiable factor, how did that impact the, uh, the gut biome in these 10,000 people? How did the, um, how, how did- Those differences magnify in, oh. in, the, out, in the outcomes. Well, in those, that study or, or that um, initiative was, didn't have a longitudinal component to it or a perturbation of the system and looking at before and after. So it really was just a, a one-time observation, one-time observation saying, okay, if we just look across a population of people. What are the, and this is super early on. So we didn't know anything about the microbiome. We barely knew how to sequence the thing. And so, and even things like, well, what's, what should the sample be? Should it be a scoop of somebody's stool? Should it be in the entirety of the stool? Should you do 16S sequencing, which is just a, a gene that kind of all microbes have, or should you do the whole genome sequencing? That's going to be a lot more expensive. This is a government funded project. And so, you know, there was a lot of unknowns at that time. So even just getting this information of if I looked across 10,000 people from, you know, skin to gut to, uh, you know, vaginal microbiome, what does it look like? That was a huge endeavor. And of course, coming out of that have been a, a ton of longitudinal studies and studies where people have done actual interventions. Mm -hmm. 